Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back for part 2 of Evolution Part 1. So now we're moving on to natural selection. So natural selection works in populations of one organism and within that organism you are going to have lots of variation of heritable characteristics. So that's things like size, speed, agility, visual acuity, digestive enzymes, colors, etc. So these are all the characteristics that can get passed on from the parent to the offspring. Now, some of these variations will be more favorable than others. So in a given environment, one variation, one adaption might give an individual an advantage over another individual of the same species. And so because it has a competitive advantage, what that means is it might be able to get more food, it might be able to avoid predators more efficiently, it might get the best nesting sites. And so this is obviously a favourable thing. And so obviously having this particular variation that gives you the advantage, well that means you are more likely to survive, you're more likely to have offspring, those offspring are more likely to make it to adulthood, and as such those favourable variations will get passed on to the next generation. And so it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that what's going to happen is, is unfavorable characteristics will slowly get removed from the population and the favorable characteristics will slowly become more and more dominant. And as such, your organism will slowly adapt to its environment over time. Now, there is a, another type of natural selection, which is called sexual selection. And this actually operates on a different set of rules to natural selection as a whole. So in the case of sexual selection, what you have are males competing with other males for mates. And the females will select the males based on such traits like showy tail feathers, bright colors, etc. Now, what this means is, is you can have an organism that's actually going to evolve to essentially almost, you know, not work. So think of the classic example of a male peacock. So a male peacock is bright blue in color and it has huge showy tail feathers. Now, from a normal point of view, in terms of natural selection, that's useless. Because think about it, if you're bright blue, you're gonna stand out, all the predators are going to be able to see you, and that big, long, showy tail is going to stop you getting away very quickly. And so this obviously means that from a pure, you know, if you think about it from a, a, a pure point of natural selection, the male peacock design shouldn't really work. However, it does work because what the male peacock is not trying to do is it's not trying to get away, it's not trying to hide itself, it's trying to make itself as big and bold as possible because it's operating using the process of sexual selection. So it's trying to make itself stand out deliberately so it can get the best mates. So this means every once in a while what happens is, is a species as it evolves might actually seem to develop traits which are not advantageous. And the reason that that could happen is because there could be some degree of sexual selection kicking in and that's helping to you know, bring out these traits that you would otherwise not assume would come to the fore. Okay, so natural selection is sometimes also called survival of the fittest. Now, this is actually a bit misleading, as it suggests that only the fittest will survive, and that's not really the case. But in, rea in reality, it's not just a matter of survival. It also involves these inheritable variations, and of course, these inheritable variations will lead to reproductive success. So the variant may be, you know, it may make you the strongest, the fastest, the biggest, but it doesn't always mean you're going to be a good parent. And so what's happened now is survival of the fittest is now often described as survival of the fitter or survival of the fit enough. So essentially it's saying, you know, you don't have to be the, the dominant, you know, the, the apex organism of that particular species. But as long as you have the adaptions to make you successful enough so that you can breed and successfully uh, raise offspring, well, then your uh, heritable characteristics are going to get passed on to the next generation. So natural selection works on the existing variation within a population and this will give some a competitive advantage over others. So evolution by inheritance can mean that if there is a sudden drastic change in the environment, so for instance let's say some kind of disease sweeps through you know, the, the prey that you eat and all the slow prey dies. So all you have left are, left are the fast variants of the animal that you want to eat. 
and so obviously you have to adapt to those new conditions. So that's a very sudden change. But there are also gradual changes which will occur over several variations. So think of something like uh, human, uh, well, no, think of the evolution of the genus Homo, which includes human beings. So over time, we've seen our jaw shape change, our brain size change. We've seen changes in our foot and hand shape. We've seen our pelvis shift as we've gone from walking on four limbs to two limbs. And all these changes over time will make the species more competitive. So sometimes the, the type of natural selection we're dealing with can be a, a single event. So in this first event, obviously, if you're the fastest predator, you're more likely to be able to be successful in this particular situation. However, sometimes um, natural selection will operate over several different variables simultaneously. So the nice thing about evolution by natural selection is that it can be tested by looking at the fossil record. So we can go back in time and look at how things have actually worked in the past. And we can also test natural selection in the lab as well. Now, in the case of Lamarck's inheritance of acquired characteristics, so if you remember that, you know, for instance, the, the short-necked giraffe stretches its neck to be able to reach the leaves higher on the tree, and because it's stretched its neck, that trait then gets passed on to the next generation. Well, in the case of Lamarck's inheritance of acquired characteristics, unfortunately, you can't really make it work in the lab. And people have tried. There were experiments involving giraffes, you know, for instance, trying to make them, you know, stretch as hard as they could to get to the leaves to see whether that would, you know, produce any kind of change. And the answer is no. So Lamarck's inheritance of acquired characteristics, well, you might be able to use the fossil record as evidence for that. But in terms of being able to test it in a lab, you're just going to meet with failure. In the case of natural selection, you can see it in the fossil record and you can also produce the same results in the lab so you can test it in a controlled environment. So this is one of the reasons why evolution is essentially considered to be the better model over inheritance of acquired characteristics, for instance. So a classic example of evolution driven by a single rapid change is the peppered moth. So before the Industrial Revolution, the majority of peppered moths had a spotted white, grey, black coloration. So here is a standard looking peppered moth. However, what happened is, is during the Industrial Revolution in England, well, lots and lots of coal got burnt, which creates lots and lots of soot. So all of that soot would then get blown about by the wind and it would start sticking to the bark of trees. And so this meant that, you know, in areas which had a very, very high concentration of industrial activity, the trees would get covered in the black soot, and so they would take on a black colour. Now, this obviously means that if you were a normal peppered moth, which under normal circumstances would be wonderfully camouflaged, unfortunately, as soon as the tree gets covered in the black soot, you stand out a mile, and as such, you'll start to be eaten by predators because you're easier to see. So all of a sudden, we've got this sudden change, and it, essentially the characteristic that was a positive has now become a negative. And so what will happen is, is these uh, white, grey, black variants will slowly be weeded out of the population because they're going to suffer a higher rate of predation. However, the few peppered moths which are black in colour, which normally would actually be at an evolutionary disadvantage, well, then all of a sudden they found that they had the evolutionary advantage in these environments. And so what you see is you see a change in the population makeup. You see these lighter colored moths begin to become less dominant. And you see these darker colored moths becoming more dominant in these areas where you have this high industrial activity. So are there any problems with Darwinian evolution? So Darwin was a good scientist, so he was the first to admit that there were issues with his theory. And one of the key uh, things that he went and said is, is if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. So this is obviously a very, very good point that he's making here. So his model is suggesting that over time, animals will change slowly in lots of small incremental steps. However, if you can find something that doesn't make sense, that you can't explain by slow change over time by incremental steps, well, then all of a sudden evolution falls to pieces as a theory. 
So this leads to one of the most common points of attack against evolution. And the question is this, well, what use is half an eye or half a wing? So think about it, a wing is designed for you know, flying. So, you know, in theory, assuming you have these incremental steps, that means somewhere along the line of evolution, you are going to have an organism that's going to have essentially a half-formed wing, some kind of intermediate wing. Well, the question then becomes is, well, what's the point of an intermediate wing? You know, the entire point of a wing is to fly. And so all of a sudden you can begin to see that that's a pretty obvious, you know, issue which needs to be explained. So if the, you know, if these structures, if they're half formed, you know, aren't going to give you an advantage, then what's the point in them, what's the point in them evolving in the first place? However, there is one thing that this, you know, that this particular view doesn't, can't deal with. And this particular point of view assumes that the organ in question was initially designed for its current purpose. And what we've actually begun to realize is that there's actually something called repurposing that occurs during evolution. And that's the use of some structure which did have a use and essentially it's repurposed for a new use as the animal evolves. And the classic example of this is the mammalian inner ear. So we know by looking at the fossil record that mammals are evolved from reptiles. Now if we look at the reptilian ear, what you can see is we have the eardrum and we have a single bone. Okay, so the, the sound comes into the ear, strrikes the eardrum, that causes the eardrum to vibrate. The vibrations of the eardrum make this small bone vibrate, and that essentially passes information to the inner ear that then gets processed by your brain to essentially, you know, make sound. So you know what you're hearing. Now, in the case of reptiles, it's a single bone. In the case of mammals, we actually have a setup where we have three bones. Now, this actually uh, is quite helpful because it allows the noise to be amplified. So on the whole, it means that mammals have much, much better hearing than reptiles. So the question is, is well, how did we get from this to this? So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the design of the jaw. So you'll notice that in the case of mammals, the jaw itself consists of one solid bone, which is called the dentary. If you look at reptiles here, what you'll see is that you have several different bones and you also have a more complex region at the back of the skull as well. So you have several bones and of which several are quite small. And so if we look at these bones, what happens is, is we have the quadrate bone. Okay, so that's the bone in green, which is this one back here. And the articular bone which is going to be the bone in orange, which is right here. So we have these two bones here and here, which are located in the hinge region of the jaw. Well, as the animal evolves from a reptile to a mammal, all of a sudden these two bones, well, they're not really needed. So you have, you have the uh, uh, squamosal bone up here. You can see that still persists. We have the dentary, obviously that still persists. We have what's left of the angular bone that still persists. But these two bones here, you can, you'll see they've disappeared but they haven't disappeared. What happens is, is, as we can see through the record, is that we can see these bones actually migrate from being part of the jaw, and they move up to become incorporated into the ear. And so what we have is we have evolutionary repurposing. So something which you know did have a use in the past is all of a sudden being reused for a new you know function which is going to give the animal an evolutionary advantage. And I think we can all agree that having better hearing is a definite evolutionary advantage. So do the biggest, the strongest, or the fastest really do the best? And of course, these traits are extremely useful if you're something like a male bighorn compared to, you know, competing for mates. So, you know, if you're the biggest, the strongest, then that means you're probably going to get the best mates. However, natural selection may also favor the smallest. So if, if resources suddenly become limited, well, then the animal that requires the least food is going to become the most efficient. It may also, um, more, may also favor the animals which are most uh, easily concealed. Once again, if you're living in an environment with very, very high rates of predation, being, you know, being the best at hiding yourself is a massive advantage. 
It may also be a situation where you have natural selection favoring animals that can adapt to new food sources. So something like rats, for instance, are a brilliant example of a species that is very capable of eat, you know, using multiple food sources to survive. And that's one of the things that makes them so amazingly successful. And then you also have animals that, or animals and plants that can use substances that would otherwise be harmful to other creatures. So there are examples of certain species of plant which can you know, only grow in old mines and mining sites. So what happens is, is you know, as part of the mining process, you obviously bring the minerals to the surface that you want, you take out as much of the material that you're after as you can possibly get, and then you throw the waste rock away. And so this means that old mining sites are very often very, very highly contaminated places. And so there can be lots and lots of nasty stuff, you know, things like lead and uh, antimony and other things in the soil of these old mining sites. Now, normally this stuff would kill most plants. However, there are certain plants which have actually evolved to be able to live in these very, very toxic conditions. And so once again, what you have there is you have an organism that's capable of using the, the otherwise harmful environment to its advantage. So when it comes down to it, people agreed very, very quickly that evolution was a solid theory. However, natural selection was more difficult as there was little known about the process of inheritance. So we can see in the fossil record in, in lab studies that yes, having one of these you know, uh, advantages that makes you more efficient works in your favor and therefore will probably make you more successful and allow you to uh, reproduce more successfully. However, the question then becomes is, well, how are these traits being passed on from one generation to the next? So are there any other problems with natural selection? Well, critics of natural selection were quick to point out that the Darwin-Wallace model could not account for the origins of variations. And once again, this is a pretty good point. The problem is, is you're saying, right, well, there are all these different variations within a, within a population of one species. But the question is, is, well, where did those variations actually come from in the first place? And the next question is, is, well, how can you also maintain these variations in a population? So slowly over time, what should happen is, is variants should be slowly uh, removed from the population. However, what we can see in some cases, is we can see that variants which were otherwise, you know, uh, lost from a population can suddenly reappear when the environment changes. So let's say there's a, there's some adaption which does not give an evolutionary advantage for a while. You'll steadily see that removed from the population. Then all of a sudden the environment changes and that characteristic which was a problem in the past all of a sudden becomes a strength and you'll see that characteristic then reappear in the population. So the question then becomes is, well, how does that happen? How can you have this variation persisting in a population when you would normally assume it would be bred out of the population and lost? So their argument was is that any variation would be rapidly diluted and lost. And these arguments persisted until around the 1900s. However, interestingly, the evidence to actually explain what was going on was produced by a gentleman called Gregor Mendel in 1860. Okay, so uh, Gregor Mendel was an Austrian monk, and he was interested in the variation that he observed in plants, especially garden peas. So in 1860, he conducted a series of controlled experiments on pea plants. And what he, you know, uh, controlled, I should say, controlled means essentially you, uh, you control as many variables as possible so each plant gets the same amount of light it gets the same amount of water gets the same soil you know everything's kept at the same temperature and so this means that all the plants are treated as equally as possible therefore any differences that do occur must be due to factors which you cannot control so he experimented on what are referred to as true breeding strains of garden peas and so this is a, an, a plant that if you self-fertilize it, it will always display the same trait. So for instance, it will always display the same color. So if you, you, know, so if you take a pea plant, you self-fertilize it, and that pea plant is pink. If you self-fertilize it, the offspring it will produce will also always be pink in color. 
So through his experiments, he concluded that traits are controlled by a pair of factors, and he called these genes. And genes are composed of two forms which are referred to as alleles. So one allele may be dominant over the other. So for instance, in human beings, the allele for brown eyes is on the whole dominant over the allele for blue and green eyes. The offspring will receive one allele from each parent. So let's look at an example of how this is going to work. So here we go. So here's the experiment. So this is the first generation up here. So we have a true breeding variety, which is white in color. And we have a true breeding variety of a pea plant, which is pink in color. And so what we're saying is, is, is the, these alleles the, uh, that's going to help control the color of the plant, we're going to give them different labels. So we're going to say, right, well, this white plant here must have two white alleles. So that will be one from the mother, one from the father. And so we're going to call these essentially lowercase a. In the case of the pink true breeding pea plant, well, obviously, once again, it must have two alleles, one from each parent, but we're going to call these uppercase A. And so what happens is when these two plants breed, we're going to have one allele going from each parent. So we're going to have one uppercase allele, or one uppercase A, and one lowercase A combining to form the offspring, which is going to have the makeup uppercase A, lowercase A. So essentially, it's going to have the pink allele, and it's going to have the white allele. And so what we see is the offspring produced in all these instances is going to be pink in color. So we know that the pink allele is dominant over the white allele. Okay, so that's stage one. So then what uh, Gregor Mendel went and did is he then went and took these second generation plants and he bred them together. So he went and took two of these plants here and he went and bred them. Now we know that these plants have one pink allele and one white allele and so what happens well obviously you're going to have one plant of the the offspring that's going to have both the pink allele so that's obviously going to have a pink color you're going to have one plant that's going to have the pink allele and the white allele so once again that's going to have a pink color you're going to have one plant that's going to have the pink allele and the white allele and that's going to have a pink color but then you're going to have a fourth plant that's going to receive the white allele and the white allele and that's going to have a white color and so what you've just seen is you've seen a characteristic from one generation which appeared to be lost reappearing in a later generation and so what this is showing is it's showing that these traits do not blend so you know in, in one the arguments would be right okay if i'm taking a, a dark pink plant and i'm breeding it with a white white plant well maybe the two colors will combine and i'll end up with plants which are a kind of medium pink in color so we would have blended the characteristics but that's not the case what this is showing is that these characteristics do not blend they exist independently of each other and this means that even though traits are not expressed they are still there in the genetic makeup so they don't get lost they just hang around and therefore, variation in populations is explained by these alternate expressions of these alleles because they don't blend. So essentially, when the conditions are right, one of these different traits can begin to become important and it will move back you know, into, into the population. And so this allows variation to be maintained. So it means that the, you know, the, the options you know, for all these variations always exist in the population. You just need the right environmental conditions to make that particular variant become helpful, at which point it will begin to reappear in the population again. So the information that your body uses to initially build you and then to make new cells to replace the ones that die in your body, well, of course, that's stored in DNA. Now, if we were to if we were to keep what you know our genetic material as one piece of DNA in a cell, the molecule itself would be absolutely monstrous. Okay, so what's happened is is inside cells the DNA is split up into little pieces for easy storage, and these things are referred to as chromosomes. And human beings have twenty three of them. So the number of chromosomes will actually vary from species to species. So chimpanzees have 24, bananas have 11, and fruit flies have four chromosomes. Now, 
it should be pointed out that the number of chromosomes therefore doesn't actually say anything about how you know how intelligent your animal is so i think we can all agree that there's a very good chance that a fruit fly is more intelligent than the banana okay so the number of chromosomes really means nothing it just says how many pieces is your dna split up into for easy storage and of course these chromosomes are further organized into smaller segments which we refer to as genes and of course each gene contains the recipe for a specific function of your cell and genes are hereditary they get passed on from the parent to the offspring so each portion of a chromosome contains the same genes on each side but the alleles can be different okay so if we look at these we can see we have 23 chromosomes here so this is human dna and you'll see you're going to get one half will be from the father and one half will be from the mother and so you're going to have the same genes occurring on each side so you might have the gene for eye color here and the gene for eye color here however this one could be the gene the allele for brown eye color this one could be the allele for blue eye color and we know that in, in you know, most circumstances, the brown allele will be dominant over the blue allele in, when it comes to eye color in human beings. So each one of these genes will have the same, each one of these chromosomes, sorry, will have the same genetic information in each half. However, the alleles will vary. The only exception for human beings is chromosome 23, which is the one that determines gender. So women have two X segments, so they'll have two of, of these. However, men have an X segment and a Y segment. And so this difference is what helps to uh, lead to the different genders. So in terms of reproduction, we need to think about how this works, because of course it's going to help us to explain how evolution is actually occurring. So in sexually reproducing organisms, sex cells are produced. So for plants, we have pollen and ovules. So pollen is the male and ovules are the female. And in animals, we of course have sperms, sperm and eggs. Now, these uh, cells are produced uh, when a cell undergoes a type of division, which is referred to as meiosis. And this process yields cells which have only one chromosome of each pair so it has half the genetic information from the parent so all the sex cells contain half of each chromosome so that means when the sperm and the egg combine you get the you get the genetic information half the genetic information from the father half the genetic information from the mother and so those combine to give you a full set of genetic material for the offspring So meiosis, of course, is the process that produces sex cells, and each one of those will contain one member from each chromosome pair. So let's look at this diagram here, which is going to help to show the process. So here we go. So this is our sex cell. So this is going to be used to make, so let's just say this is the cell that's going to be used to make the sex cells. So here we go. So we have two chromosomes. One of them is smaller, so we have the green half and the red half, and the second one is larger. We have the red half and the green half there. And so what's going to happen is, is your cell is going to essentially reproduce each half of the chromosome. So here you go, you can see we've produced a second copy of the, the larger red half, and we've produced a second copy of the smaller green half, and the same over here. So then what happens is that your cell divides in two. So you have this portion, okay, is going over here, and this portion is going over here. So you can see we still have the genetic information, so we still have the large portion of the chromosome over here and here, and a small one here and here. And then what happens is, is these cells split in two, so half of this material goes to this cell, half of this material goes to this cell, half of that to that cell, half of that to that cell. And so essentially you end up with four cells which each have half the genetic information of the original cell. So this is for the formation of sperm. In the case of the formation of eggs, the same process occurs. However, only one of the four eggs produced will actually be viable. And of course, when it comes to reproduction, the genetic information from the sperm will combine with the genetic information from the egg. And essentially, at that point, you will have a full set of genetic information for the offspring.
So once you actually have functioning cells, well, at that point, you obviously need to be able to take the existing cells you have and you need to be able to split them up to make new cells. And this process is called mitosis. So in the case of mitosis, what happens is here's our genetic information again. So we have two chromosomes. We have the large chromosome here. There's the red half. There's the green half. And we have the small chromosome here. There's the red half. There's the green half. And what's going to happen is, is the cell is once again going to create a copy of each portion of the chromosome. So we have a copy of the large red part, a copy of the large green part, a copy of the small green part, and a copy of the small red part. And you can see them right here. And this genetic information will literally line itself up along the center of the cell. And so what happens is, is then the cell will split itself straight down the middle, and of course that takes half the genetic information one way and half the genetic information the other way. And we can see this material here marked in these blue colors on this image. So this image is showing you a cell dividing. So this is the genetic information here in blue. You can see it's lined up mostly on the center there. That's where the darkest colors are. And you can see what happens over time is it gets pushed. One half goes one way, one half goes the other way until you end up with two completely separate cells. And so by doing this process, you are able to take one cell, split it into two. And of course, that becomes very, very important, of course, when you're growing, because you need to be able to increase the number of cells in your body so you can get bigger. This is also the process which the body uses to replace cells which have become damaged or died. So mitosis duplicates cells, but there's no change in the chromosome number. Okay, so this is a good place to stop. So once again, let's stop here, get up, have a walk around, go and get a drink of water or something, take a few minutes to relax, and then please come back for part three.